Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to the first meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. I hope everyone is thoroughly refreshed. Uh, if you can still remember Christmas New Year, then congratulations um, and welcome back. Uh, can I ask everyone in the room to please ensure that mobile phones are switched off or to silent? We have received apologies this morning from Alec Cole Hamilton and from David Stewart. And welcome Anas Sarwar as substitute for David Stewart at this morning's meeting. Uh, in accordance with Section 3 of the Code of Conduct, I invite Anna Sauer to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. Uh, any declaration should be brief but sufficiently detailed to make clear the nature of any interest. Anas. Thank you, Chair. Nothing to declare except to say I'm a former NHS dentist. Thank you very much and welcome to uh, the committee. Uh, the next item of our, our agenda is an evidence session on the draft budget 2019-20. Uh, the committee's approach to scrutiny of the draft budget reflects the approach recommended by the Budget Process Review Group. This entails addressing budget implications throughout the year and bringing this information together to inform a pre-budget report for consideration by the Cabinet Secretary. Members will recall that we issued our pre-budget report on the 29th of October. That report set out some recurring themes and issues we had identified in relation to the Scottish Government's draft budget the timing of the report in advance of publication of the draft budget was to enable the Scottish Government, if it chose, to endorse our recommendations uh, to implement them in the draft budget. Uh, a response to a report was received from the Cabinet Secretary on the 21st December and absolutely on cue. Uh, may I welcome to the committee uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Jean Freeman, the Director General uh, Health and Social Care and Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, uh, Paul Gray, and Richard McCallum. Deputy Director for Health, Finance and Infrastructure. And can I invite the Cabinet Secretary uh, uh, to make an opening statement? Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning to you and members. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to give evidence this morning on the budget proposals for our health and care services. The emphasis in this budget is ensuring that resources are directed appropriately in support of our frontline services. It is our outstanding health and care staff who deliver those frontline services, and I want to take the opportunity to pay tribute to them this morning, in particular to the hard work that they have undertaken over what has been another busy Christmas and New Year period. The budget for 2019-20 supports the medium-term financial framework and sets out the next steps in our financial plans. When I outlined the framework to Parliament back in October, I made clear that all resource consequentials would be passed on in full, and I said that, and I quote, in finalising the financial framework, I've made the perhaps bold assumption that the UK government will honour its commitment, deliver the consequentials as a true net benefit, and not reduce the Scottish government's funding by cuts applied elsewhere or by other measures. I was therefore disappointed and concerned about the potential impact on our spending plans when the UK autumn budget confirmed a reduction in health consequentials of 55 million for 2019-20. But as part of our proposed budget, the Scottish Government has both passed on resource consequentials in full and provided additional funding of 55 million pounds. This reinstates the UK Government's reduction and protects the resources for our frontline services. The Scottish Budget for 1920 sets out total investment for health and sport portfolio in excess of £14 billion and provides a further shift in the balance of spend towards mental health and to primary community and social care. In 1920, our investment in social care and integration will exceed £700 million. This is an important next step in delivering our commitment that by the end of this Parliament, more than half of spending will be in community health services. We will invest an additional 430 million in our frontline NHS boards, which provides an uplift of funding of 4.2% in cash terms. We will continue our policy of supporting those boards furthest from NRAC parity, and will invest 23 million to ensure that no board is further than 0.8% from parity in 2019-20. We will provide funding of 392 million to improve patient outcomes. 
This will support our waiting times improvement plan and will lead to sustainable, substantial improvements to performance, including the aim that by spring 2021, 95% of outpatients and 100% of inpatients will wait less than 12 weeks to be treated. Our investment in improving patient outcomes will take overall funding to 940 million to support the Scottish GP contract and the reform of primary care, continuing to support health and social care integration and allowing GPs more time to spend with those who need it most. In terms of sport, the budget supports the people of Scotland to become more physically active as part of our efforts to prevent ill health and improve well-being whilst delivering world-class sporting performances. In 1920, Sport Scotland will receive additional funding of 3% in cash terms, taking their overall budget to 32.7 million. We will continue to underwrite the potential shortfall in lottery funding of up to 3.4 million, and will continue to encourage the UK government to take the necessary actions to address lottery reductions. In terms of capital, Capital investment in 1920 will amount to 336 million. This includes investment in the Baird Family Hospital and the Anchor Centre in Aberdeen and will support increasing elective capacity across the country. Members will be aware of my intention to bring a capital investment strategy to Parliament by the end of this financial year. And this new strategy will create a framework considering necessary investment over the longer term and will accompany the medium-term financial framework. It will include important investment in primary and community care projects, which will be key in delivering the emerging health and social care integration agenda and continuing to shift the balance of care from hospitals to local facilities and people's homes. In terms of the planning and performance cycle, 1920 will be the first year of our new planning and performance cycle. In return for their efforts to deliver the reforms set out in the delivery plan and the financial framework, boards will be required to deliver a break-even position over a three-year period rather than annually, as is the case currently. In each year, boards will have 1% flexibility on their annual resource budget to allow them the scope to marginally underspend or overspend in that year. In order to give all our territorial boards clear ground to move forward, as members know, I will not seek to recover their outstanding brokerage. This is money that has already been spent in providing patient care and has been accommodated within the overall health and sport portfolio budget. In conclusion, Convener, the Scottish Budget for 1920 passes on consequentials in full to health and care, with the additional support to ensure that the money anticipated from the UK Government is now met uh, with that additional funds from the Scottish Government. Uh, it goes over and above that to protect the plans set out in the medium-term financial framework. The spending plans are supported by greater flexibility to assist boards in planning beyond one year and to consider key areas of investment, such as in relation to primary care, mental health and waiting times improvement. This will support our boards, along with integration authorities, to deliver the measures set out in the delivery plan and the financial framework in a safe and appropriate way, making sure that they maintain a strong focus on care and the delivery of services that are safe, effective, person-centred and timely. And I would commend the budget to this committee and, of course, answer any questions members may have. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that's very helpful. And clearly, since uh, uh, the process of this year's budget began, uh, there have been quite a number of changes uh, in the way in which financial information is presented uh, with the medium-term financial framework and other, other innovations which uh, uh, this committee has broadly uh, welcomed. Can I ask about one uh, aspect that stands out from the... Uh, tables presenting uh, uh, level three uh, spending plans, and that is the way in which uh, planned efficiency savings are concentrated under a single line uh, under uh, the miscellaneous services. And, and the consequence of that clearly is that that line stands out uh, as being the one area uh, which, uh, of, of, if you like, uh, reduced spending. What, what I think the committee would be keen to understand is how that will 
work through in terms of impact on spending lines over the course of the financial year. So the, the, the efficiency savings appear to be concentrated in one place, but are presumably will be dispersed across the department, and we'd like to understand how that's likely to impact on what are otherwise uh, real terms uh, increases in some of those spending lines. Thank you, convener. I'm going to ask uh, Ms McCallum to initially answer that question, then, sure. and then I'll come in. OK, um, perhaps two or three things that it would be helpful just to, to set out on that. I, I think the first thing um, the committee might find uh, helpful to note is that we always start the year with a level of efficiency savings that we need to make at a portfolio level, and that was the same in 2018-19 as it is in 1920. Uh, I, we, we take this approach as a prudent approach because there can be slippage on certain programmes and, and, and there is the opportunity for savings that might occur. And so this is a, 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 an approach that recognises that. If I think about the 2018-19 the budget and, and where we've got to this year with some of those efficiency savings, it's on specific programme lines that are under the de department departmental allocations line. So it's things like our digital programs, it's the costs associated with NPD, which can fluctuate from and, and, and go down. Um, it's in relation to clinical negligence costs, which, which also tend to, to, to go down, um, and, and, and slippage on, on some of our other programs. So it, it's, it's the most prudent approach to have it on that single line. We wouldn't want to apply hard and fast savings to each, uh, each budget line. That wouldn't seem uh, a proportionate approach. Um, and we work with um, each directorate and policy area that's taking those, um, those programme lines forward to, to support them with that work. Um, so I think that's probably the, the, the key things. I guess probably the, 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 the most important thing is in our core areas of spend, whether that's primary care or whether it's mental health or whether it's waiting times improvement, we wouldn't see those efficiencies being applied to those lines. We would be keen to see those move forward as we've set out in the budget. So just so to understand, so, so essentially you're saying that you make pessimistic assumptions about areas like the cost of NPD, the cost of medical negligence, That's and correct. then look to achieve efficiency savings from those, um, from, from, from the pessimism uh, uh, impact, if you like, or the impact of, of what actually comes through. That's correct. So we would, we would start with a figure that we, we think it could be, um, uh, uh, and it is generally a, a, mo a more pessimistic scenario. And then, and, and then through the year, we see if that will, will play out as we expect or not. OK. The, the only thing I, I would add to that, convener, is, of course, officials uh, work through that in this way based on their knowledge of how uh, programmes have uh, performed in previous years. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm interested in issues around the community spending and primary care and, and how... You're describing, Cabinet Secretary, that half of the spending will be in communities. So I'm aware that there's a lot of work being done, especially locally in Dumfries and Galloway, to support primary care and uh, the Transform in Wigdenshire programme, for instance, to look at better ways of health and social care integration and care in the community. So I'm interested in the the fact that the current um, the budget is uh, nine percent of the current uh, primary care with a target of 11 percent so um, that target seems to be pretty reasonable um, do you think it's ambitious enough for transferring money into the community and primary care so uh, as you rightly say our, our target is to uh, reach a position where 11 percent of uh, NHS budget is uh, in primary care by the end of this parliament uh, at 9% in the current draft budget. Uh, we're certainly on track to deliver that. Uh, I would want to hold to that position in this financial year uh, and look in the next financial year and the budget that comes forward then, whether we want to, based on performance, whether or not we want to uh, increase uh, our uh, ambition for that 11%. But at this point, I think the prudent approach is to say that we are well on track to meet our commitment of 11%. Uh, I need to see uh, how well we uh, deliver improvements in areas which are effectively hospital-based care, thinking particularly around the waiting times improvement plan. If that plan is delivered against its trajectory uh, and depending on where the financial uh, situation is in uh, 2021, then uh, we may want to increase that uh, target of 11%. Thank 
but at this point, I think it's prudent to stay with it and to say that we're well on track to meet it. Okay. And and next question is about community hospitals. Um, there, uh, in the budget proposed, the community hospitals be part of the community budget, which is actually probably pretty reasonable, as my understanding as a former NHS employee is that uh, many community hospitals are managed by local general practices as well. So that seems reasonable that uh, community hospitals will be part of community spending and not acute care spending. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, community hospitals are, are as they say, uh, located in the community and should be part of that overall shift in the balance of care and also be part of making sure that people are in the acute setting uh, for the period of their clinical need uh, and for no longer. And so I know from uh, some examples that some of our community-based hospitals are used as both step-down uh, and step-up care. Uh, some perform uh, a re-enablement uh, function. Uh, as well as other areas. So there is a, a range of ways by which community hospitals can contribute to that shift in the balance of care from the acute setting to the community. Okay, all right, and, um, thank you. And my final question is that uh, whether you think that the Scottish Government could commit to publishing updates on progress towards various commitments as part of the budget document? Um, I, I'd, I'd appreciate knowing perhaps which ones you might be thinking of. So we, we currently uh, publish uh, a monthly, uh, on a monthly basis, where our boards are in terms of their financial position uh, and obviously quarterly in terms of the IJBs. The uh, Waiting Times Improvement Plan uh, commits to uh, advising Parliament and clearly this committee uh, of progress against the milestones that it sets. Um, I understand the, the, uh, there is a similar set of commitments in terms of uh, our invest, additional investment in mental health. Um, so if there are other areas, then um, we're certainly happy to consider that. Now, I think for me, um, it's just handy to get on the record that we have these um, reports that are currently published, whether it's monthly, quarterly, yeah. as required. So I wanted to just make sure that we got that on the okay. record. Thanks. OK, thank you. Brief supplementary, Sandra Hoyt. Thank you very much. I noticed, uh, Cabinet Secretary, in your opening remarks about the Barnet consequentials and the shortfall. I also raised that, and I've actually written down, could this see reductions in future? Uh, I just wondered, have you had any assurances from the UK government that there will not be future reductions? Because you're talking £55 million reductions. So I just wondered to, to clarify that point. Um, well, well, no, we haven't had uh, any uh, assurances from the UK government. Um, they uh, made a commitment in June, which was not then honoured. Uh, uh, later in the year, that left with us with a £55 million shortfall. Um, this government's commitment is to make that good on a recurring basis. Uh, obviously, we'll continue uh, to press the UK government um, to uh, revisit uh, its position. Uh, but I think we generally all be agreed, whatever our position is, that right at the moment, uh, on this day and this date, we are a bit uncertain what the future might look like, um, but we are certain that this government will continue to meet our commitment on that shortfall. Thank you. Thank George, you, George Adam. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'd just like to follow on from what Sandra White was asking with regard to the Barnet Consequentials. Uh, it's, I'm glad, it was, it was good to hear that you say that all resources uh, you would actually put straight into the NHS uh, uh, with regards to the Consequentials, but it's disappointing to see that there is actually a £55 million black hole, effectively. It's almost as if the Westminster, I like to keep things quite simple, Cabinet Secretary, you know that, and it's almost as if the Westminster government's picked the pocket of the health service to the tune of £55 million a year. Now, when you look at that, I'm glad that the Scottish government's actually taking that £55 million and they're, they're covering it, but the whole scenario is, when I was reading this over the weekend, the thing that kept, the question that kept coming back in my head was, what would be the impact on the health service if the Scottish Government hadn't actually kind of, uh, made sure that that £55 million a year was available? Uh, uh, well, um, uh, if you look, for example, at uh, uh, how the additional monies are going into frontline spending, 
than uh, additional in 2019-20 uh, in terms of um, the work of uh, our work on elective uh, meeting those targets. Um, then there is additional money going in there, which would not, you know, so that's an example mm -hmm. of some of the difficult decisions that would have had to be made. Uh, the commitment on uh, mental health is another. Uh, the commitment, these are significant areas of additional spend, uh, primary care reform, of course, and transferring the funds uh, uh, towards, uh, the, in terms of the balance of care, towards community care, the, the additional resource that is going uh, from the health budget into local government for integrated health and social care, uh, around 120 million, uh, 30 million, in order to uh, ensure that we implement Frank's law uh, in the widest sense to everyone under 65, uh, and so on. So there are a number of examples of where, if uh, that shortfall hadn't been uh, made by the Scottish Government, that we would have had more difficult decisions uh, to make than we currently have. However, the other side of that is also to say that having uh, made good that shortfall from the overall Scottish budget in a situation where the Scottish Government's budget is significantly reduced, then that puts pressure elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So the money has to come from somewhere. Um, I, it should have come from the UK government because that was the commitment that they made. They didn't honour that commitment. The Scottish government uh, has uh, worked to make good that shortfall, but that does put pressure elsewhere in the Scottish budget, a Scottish budget that is already significantly reduced as a consequence of UK government decisions. Cabinet Secretary, many of the issues that you mentioned and services that you mentioned during your first answer there is, regardless of political party, is stuff that we all support. You know, so effectively, is it not the case that if you vote against this budget, you're not only just actually going against the £55 million extra into the NHS provided by the Scottish <coughs> Government, but you're actually going against supporting all these things like Frank's Law, like these other kind of campaigns that we've had here. Is that not the case that, you know, you've taken a very pragmatic view to actually see that we could push things forward? Secretary, we're not here to discuss the votes for or against the budget. That's a matter you can use your discretion as to how far you go down that road. But clearly, uh, we do want to know uh, uh, the, the, the evidence that you are able to bring forward in support of your budget proposal. Well, absolutely, Convener, and I, I completely appreciate that. But the, 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 the simple fact is that at the end of the day, this committee will have uh, views that it wants to express in terms of this part of the draft budget. Parliament as a whole will make decisions on the overall uh, budget. But uh, what I am saying very clearly is that if, uh, if the health and uh, sport portfolio has less money than is currently in this draft budget, then difficult decisions do need to be made, and those are around uh, areas where there is significant level of spend, be it in mental health, be it in uh, addiction uh, work, be it in the extension in terms of Frank's law. And I'm sure every member of this committee is cognisant of that, uh, that there, there, is, uh, there is no money hidden anywhere. It's here. And if this isn't supported, then those difficult decisions have to be made about what cannot be afforded. Just one final question, Convener, on the back of uh, what the Cabinet Secretary said in answer to Sandra White. When you mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, Sandra asked uh, whether it was a case of have you got any guarantees from the Westminster Government, will there be other ways that they'll find to make sure that there's no barnet consequentials and you get further cuts? Is there any, is there, has there been any guarantee that, you know, they won't, won't continue to go down this route to find ways to actually uh, attack Scotland's health service? Um, in terms of overall funding from uh, the UK government uh, uh, that come as a result of consequentials, then th there, is no there is no guarantee beyond uh, where we are in this current year. And of course, there may well be a subsequent UK budget, uh, depending on uh, how uh, decisions play out uh, with respect to uh, Brexit, as the, the Chancellor himself said. Uh, he may need to come back, in his view, uh, and uh, introduce another UK budget. So we, we cannot be sure. Mm -hmm. um, so there are no guarantees, nor can we be sure uh, in what way, if at all, the position may change. Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I take you to the medium term health and social care financial framework, which uh, was published uh, uh, towards the end last year, was very helpful. I wonder if you can lay out for us what level of savings will be expected in 2019-20 uh, from health boards and from integration authorities. So do you have that there? Thank you. Members will see the nature of my briefing, and trust me, I have read it all, but it's not always straightforward for me to find exactly uh, the bit that I need. Um, so the uh, financial framework indicates um, uh, health demand pressures of up to 4% above inflation, um, and the level of savings that are required um, from uh, the boards in this uh, current financial year is, uh, it's not here in front of me, do you have it? Yeah, um, so we're still working through with, with health boards. They will have received the budget and they'll, they'll be now working through their financial plans for, for next year. Um, we expect the savings that boards require to, to make to be of a similar level as, as in 2018-19 and 2017-18. Um, but with, that's something that we'll be working through with boards over the course of the next, next couple of months. For a ballpark figure to understand the... the the, the rough territory in which you're uh, talking, what is what is the current year's level of savings and how, how far do you expect that to be increased or, or, or repeated? So, so health boards are making about 4.5% of savings in 2018-19. In and that's and, and it's in in that sort of territory that you anticipate savings yes. in, in, in the coming year. Can and, I, sorry, yes, convener, please, can I just make a point that I think is um, often misunderstood because we talk about savings <laughs> in the, those, the boards are, the boards hold that money. So they, re, they use it to reinvest. And I know from my own experience at Golden Jubilee that in order, when you make efficiency savings or other savings in terms of how the board delivers its work, what you are doing is in effect using that resource to apply to another area of the board's activity. So it's not money that comes back into uh, central government. Sure, uh, understood, but, but, but uh, in your financial framework, you laid out an expectation of 1.7 billion in savings by 2023-24. And can I ask how far you believe that this budget uh, keeps you on track for that uh, medium term target? Well, it does keep us on track. I mean, the, this budget has been um, devised and then uh, negotiated uh, with uh, the finance secretary uh, in order to be in line with the medium term financial framework. And obviously, uh, he and his officials uh, contributed to that medium-term financial framework at the point that we were pulling it together. And the financial framework suggested that even in that context, there may still be a funding gap yes. of some £159 yes. uh, million. Pounds. What, what's your expectation in terms of addressing or, 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 or filling that funding gap? Going well, that, <clears throat> that work is uh, underway. Uh, it requires considerable uh, consultation between ourselves and... Uh, major groups of clinicians, uh, boards and of course uh, our local authorities to look at two things. One, uh, how effective we are in the coming period in continuing uh, the reform of delivery and shifting, both in shifting uh, the balance of care from acute to the community setting, but also in the delivery in uh, the acute setting. Uh, and uh, the setting that, so our anticipated um, uh, level of spend in the light of those reforms in delivery that don't uh, diminish at all either the patient experience or patient outcomes against the level of demand and where we think uh, there are ways in which we need to either uh, make some difficult decisions in the longer term uh, or ways in which we think that we need to uh, secure additional resources in order to meet the shortfall. My, my feeling at this point, and I should stress it is only a feeling, is that it will be over time, over the period of the medium-term financial framework and the years that we've set out there, it will be a mix of looking for the reprioritisation of our existing resources, some additional resources, and some uh, deliverables in terms of uh, better use of resources when we uh, fully reform the process. Thank you. Uh, Sandra White, I think, had a question in that area as well. Thank, thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary and Mr Gray and Mr McCallum also. 
Um, you'll be aware that um, the, the committee on previous occasions has looked at the, basically the, 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 the concerned about the reliance on, on in-year allocation budgets to health boards. And I do note that health boards or the national boards I have received an increase and it will be topped up in other boards by um, basically various other uh, departments, health boards and in-year department allocation as well. Now, we have raised before about would it be better that uh, health boards get the monies at the beginning of the year rather than in-year uh, allocations as well? And obviously, one of the questions I want to be asked, could they budget better if they had the money earlier rather than later? Uh, and I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary agreed with the reliance, as I say, on in-year allocations, to, which we in the committee has raised, do they hamper the board's ability, basically, uh, to plan over a longer-term framework? And would it, in fact, be more helpful to allocate these funds at the start of the financial year? So, so I understand the, the question. I, I need to say that um, in the draft budget, 90% uh, of uh, what boards will be receiving is in their baseline. So that is a significant <coughs> amount of money. Mm -hmm. And in terms of planning, we have taken the point about um, prudent financial planning should be over a longer time frame than a year, which is why we have set the three-year uh, mm -hmm. financial planning framework uh, for boards starting from 1920. Um, but I think there, there needs to be uh, a balance. So boards receive and are receiving 90% uh, in terms of their baseline funding, so they know uh, what they uh, have to, to deliver their services against, uh, and they can plan for that, including uh, in that, of course, uh, being able to meet the commitments on uh, workforce pay and so on, uh, and plan maintenance and other uh, matters. However, uh, I am also very keen that where we have uh, specific areas of work that we have set as a priority, and I'm thinking here of waiting times and of uh, our commitment, significant commitment and the resource that backs it on both waiting times and mental health, that we fund to results. Uh, now, what I mean by that is not you've got to deliver the result and then we give you the money, but I want to know that if a board is receiving £2 million, exactly what will be the impact of that on how many patients in order to reduce waiting times in what specialisms. And there is, so there, I think there needs to be a mix where boards have a significant degree of certainty about the funding that they are working to, that 90%, but that we also very rigorously performance manage additional resources that are going to delivering services for patients against um, uh, anticipated outcomes. Uh, and therefore, we use the resources, uh, we flex them uh, across the piece. Now, if you look, for example, at some of the work in terms of waiting times, not every board is in exactly the same place in terms of meeting or not those targets and in terms of which specialisms um, they may be uh, successful in and others in not. So it's not a consistent picture across the country. I want to be able to use that additional resource in a targeted way to get to a consistent position across the country where we are actually meeting those targets. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, and boards know that there is uh, additional resource, for example, to meet waiting times or to deliver on the mental health commitments. So they can anticipate that provided they have the propositions in place that can evidence what they will additionally do and therefore additionally deliver, then the resource will be made available to them. I thank you for that, because you did, you did mention you know, that particular issue in your opening <coughs> remarks. I just wanted to, for my own self, to get a wee bit more information uh, regarding that in regards to in 2020. So in other words, you have listened to the committee as well as putting forward you know, the ideas that you have to have that extra 10% to make sure that you, the board fulfil obviously what uh, the Scottish Government, whatever makeup it is, uh, going, going forward. And I, and I do thank you for that. There's just another uh, question I wanted to come in on. Uh, what funding do you think, will, well, not do you think, you will know, I'm assuming I would ask, what funding will be made available for Public Health Scotland? And basically, in regards to if you have extra funding for Public Health Scotland, will this um, 
reduce the budgets elsewhere in, in the health portfolio. So pub Public Health Scotland um, is due to come into being um, in the next financial year. Um, it is based on uh, shared public uh, agreed standards and um, objectives with, uh, with COSLA. And we're in the business in the middle at the moment of appointing that. Now, Public Health Scotland will then take a significant role in terms of helping us deliver in some of the areas that are already in the budget, for example, uh, around... Uh, um, the diet and healthy weight strategy and uh, some of the addiction work uh, and so on. So they will have a responsibility uh, in terms of assisting in the delivery of those and the resource that they would require is already um, being set out in some of the uh, uh, budget uh, information that you already have. That aside, they will be considered as a national board um, and uh, will receive some core funding. Uh, but I, I would anticipate that core funding is at a level that is is not then seen at levels three in the budget. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to see more? Yes, please. Yeah. So <clears throat> the, the new body, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, brings together um, work that is done in a number of places, including in Health Scotland at present and also in NHS National Services Scotland. Uh, so, uh, in response to your specific question, is money being taken from other places to fund this? The answer is no, because we're, we're using the money that e currently exists. However, the coordination that, that the new public health body will provide and the ability to work much uh, more effectively with our partners, including local authorities, we believe will produce better outcomes in terms of public health uh, and population health overall. Thank you very much. That completely clarifies that for me. Thank you. Thank you very Gina. much. Uh, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Chair, um, I want to focus on um, service reform and on, on, on capital spend. Um, uh, one of the Audit Scotland findings um, was a, a severe backlog in terms of um, capital investment and maintenance required in our hospital buildings, more and more going into the danger zone. Uh, how does that m tie up with a reduction in the capital investment uh, and what priorities will be set out in the uh, strategy that is to be outlined later on this year? Um, so, as, as you rightly noticed, our, our allocation in terms of capital um, is uh, limited uh, and it will cover some of the areas that um, uh, I uh, set out earlier. Um, so, it's five, five million. Yeah, it's five, five million short of the previous year. Um, there's a 188 million in uh, core capital, 52 is there uh, for elective centres. In terms of uh, uh, backlog maintenance, um, that has come down um, since uh, 2015 uh, to the most recent figure of 2017. Um, uh, but it remains a significant area uh, for us to work through with uh, our health boards. Uh, and so whilst we've made some commitments in terms of new capital spend, um, we do have to work uh, with uh, the boards in terms of the backlog maintenance and the risk profile around that, where we have uh, about 10% is considered high risk, and that's the area of significant focus that we are undertaking with boards. But just in terms of that high risk, looking at the allocation uh, in this budget around capital investment, it would... It would, my guess is, that given you will be the capital investments that you're making to expand, um, that that will not cover the high risk that are being identified. So, in, the, in this year, do you expect all the high risk course, maintenance backlog to be cleared? And if not, in this financial year, by when? So, the the uh, core element of the capital budget <coughs> um, covers uh, maintenance, uh, and obviously the. Uh, the priority in there is to address high-risk maintenance areas. Uh, so we would expect those to be addressed in this financial year, and we will uh, be working with boards to ensure that that is the case. You then move uh, down, if you like, the priority list into significant. Uh, and once we have completed the discussions with uh, boards, we will understand better what proportion of that significant uh, uh, risk area in backlog maintenance will be able to address in this financial year, and that will then give us the trajectory. So, just forward. to clarify, Cabinet Secretary, do you expect the 
the next financial re year report on backlog maintenance and high risk to have been cleared based upon the capital investment <coughs> commitments are made in this budget? I would expect the high risk areas to be cleared, yes. Excellent. Uh, and following on to, to service reform now, uh, from Mr Gray's and I's exchanges in the, in the Audit Committee, one of the issues that c constantly comes up is around organisational reform uh, as well as service reform. Mm -hmm. But just focusing on organisational reform for a moment, because mm -hmm. uh, there's a direct link between how the organisation is run and its uh, delivery in terms of within its budgets and its maintenance. Uh, an issue that has come up regularly is around leadership, around a, a lack of uh, leadership figures, a lack of the adequately skilled individuals either to run health boards or to be executives uh, for health boards. Uh, what action is the Scottish Government taking to, to improve the leadership uh, of NHS Scotland uh, in terms of health boards and how much of that is, is a greater integration of health boards? So, uh, let, let me deal with the last question first and, and I'll ask Mr Gray to talk a bit more about the specific programmes that are underway and some of the discussions we're also having with our colleagues in COSLA around uh, leadership in uh, integrated joint boards. Uh, which uh, I know you will know uh, is an area that Audit Scotland touched upon uh, when they uh, produced their report. In terms of integration of boards, um, my primary focus uh, at this point is to ensure that our health service delivers on the commitments that we've made, uh, that it remains uh, uh, safe, effective and person-centred, uh, and that in particular we meet those commitments on mental health and on waiting times. Um, I know, and I, I know that you will too, that when you embark on a major organisational restructuring, uh, inevitably what happens is that people take their eye off one particular ball in order to uh, worry uh, or position themselves about where they may be in the new world. I don't have time for them to mm. do that. Uh, so my focus in this parliamentary term is on delivery. What a future parliament or a future government might do um, is for them to decide. Um, they may want to build on the regional working uh, that has been long existent in NHS Scotland, is currently uh, a part of uh, how we look at reforming the delivery of services in order to get the best clinical outcomes uh, they may want to build on that, they may not, but right now in this parliament I have no intention of reorganising the structures around our health boards uh, because I need everyone focused on delivery. I, mean, I, I would agree with that, I think we'd all agree that the focus has to be on uh, delivery, but if we accept the challenges around leadership, <coughs> if we accept that getting adequate number of people to fill the roles that are required do you envisage then more shared roles across health boards, so more shared financial officers, for example, uh, more skills training for individual health boards about how they manage their budgets, looking at the brokerage issues, for example? Uh, do, do you see yeah. more shared roles taking yeah. place then? Yeah. So we already have some of that uh, underway, and Mr Gray will talk about uh, where that is uh, taking place and what we learn from that. Um, and there may be, then be the opportunity to um, increase... Or, or scale that up, um, but uh, that is about the effective use of the existing resource that we've got, so that everyone keeps their eye on the delivery ball. But I'll let Mr. Gray pursue that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can upset convener. Um, well, first of all, <clears throat> uh, let me deal with the point about about adequate numbers. Um, we've just appointed uh, the cabinet secretary has just appointed chairs to. Um, NHS Grampian, NHS Western Isles, NHS Dumfries and Galloway. So, you know, when people have said that they were going, we've gone through the appropriate processes and uh, new people have been appointed. Uh, we've just appointed uh, a chief executive to NHS Highland, who will start at the beginning of February. They have an interim chief executive for one month. Um, and so I, I, I do, as I think I was trying to do at the last committee session, want to make clear to the committee that with the Cabinet Secretary, we do plan ahead for what is coming. And we are showing by these appointments that these plans 
bear fruit. In terms of um, leadership uh, in, at executive level, uh, the committee will doubtless know from documentation that, that we've provided elsewhere that, for example, Alan Gray, who is the finance director in NHS Grampian, is also providing support in NHS Tayside. That's entirely appropriate that one of our most senior and experienced finance directors should uh, assist a board that needs support. Um, and uh, as we look ahead, um, there is definitely uh, opportunity for some joint appointments. There are, for example, joint appointments already in Orkney on, uh, with local government um, at, uh, at finance director level, I believe, uh, similar considerations in Shetland. So, so where a joint appointment is appropriate, then then that 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 is considered, and where it's where it is efficient and makes sense, and where the experience is valuable, we do that. In terms of the leadership development, um, I, I can with a, a, perhaps not go into too much detail today, but I can send the committee details of Project Lift, which is our um, uh, leadership development program that has recently been implemented uh, to ensure that we're not only uh, developing the leaders who are currently in post, but those who may come forward to more senior positions. And the Scottish Leaders Forum uh, takes collaborative leadership very seriously as a core component of the learning of, of leaders in the public sector for precisely the reasons that the Cabinet Secretary has said. This is not all about structure. This is about the way people lead, the way people are able to lead across um, uh, boundaries. The ministerial steering group will meet shortly, co-chaired by the Cabinet Secretary and uh, the COSLA lead for health and social care, and they will they will consider the recommendations that are coming to them on the further development of integration within that. Clearly, leadership will be will be considered, and that again is about joint leadership. Um, I think if we if we take our eye off the the delivery ball at this stage, um, we're actually backing away from what we think is most important, which is the delivery for citizens, and also backing away from the importance we attach to collaborative leadership, which I think is fundamental to delivering what we need. So, so, can, sorry, can I just add, add a, a couple of things, and, and we'd be very happy to send the committee uh, this information in addition to what Mr Gray said about um, various leadership um, programmes that are underway. Um, there are other examples of uh, joint roles. Um, uh, for example, uh, my understanding is correctly we have a joint role in terms of nurse director between NHS mm -hmm. 24 and Dumfries and Galloway. Yeah. Uh, finance director at Golden Jubilee is, uh, has a joint role with one of our other national yeah. boards. So we'll make sure the committee is aware of where uh, that sensible uh, joint working is underway. And of course, as that uh, demonstrates itself to be effective, then there's the opportunity uh, to widen that. So, so turning the focus back, <clears throat> back to delivery in terms of service reform, mm -hmm. uh, how, how ambitious a uh, cabinet secretary do you want to be, will you be allowed to be, and do you intend to be when it comes to service reform? So that's a suitably open-ended question, Mr Sarwa. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I am uh, pretty ambitious. Uh, allowed to be, I'm, I'm not sure who might stop me uh, unless the parliament disagreed uh, with what I wanted to do. Uh, I think one of the examples uh, of uh, that work, um, I know that uh, members will be very familiar with the, the idea of collaboratives uh, and uh, quality improvement and so on and how we undertake that work. But one of the things that has struck me, uh, and I've, it's not news to anyone, is that we have uh, across the piece, and it's not particularly in health, I think it is a 20-year-old tradition actually, uh, in, in this place is that we have an over-fondness for pilots, uh, which I do not share. Um, and so we have some excellent examples of good reform in the delivery of services that is led from the ground <coughs> up uh, by cl clinicians and medical staff and others working in our health service. I can think of some examples where those reforms have actually been driven uh, by our reception and porter and other staff, uh, where uh, it works very well and then we cast out an optimistic hope that good practice will be shared. Uh, my intention is that good practice is applied mm. and we don't simply hope that someone shares it. So in the waiting times improvement plan, for example, uh, where you'll see that there is a number of measures 
uh, both to reduce uh, the current long waits, but to do uh, that in a way that is also sustainable into the future, so we don't return uh, to a similar place. Um, we have uh, brought into that uh, the work headed up by Jason Leach in terms of our quality improvement programmes and the numbers of individuals uh, that we have across our health boards who have led service improvement and reform in order to make sure that we can upscale that. We have really good track record in that area if we look at the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, and I want to see that replicated in some of this service reform uh, in the health service, but also then working with uh, local <coughs> government in terms of our uh, IJBs. And we've begun, I've begun some initial discussions with Councillor Curry, who is the COSLA lead in this area, on how we might do that using some of their experience in working with government in the Children and Young People's Collaborative, for example. Can we? I think we need to move on if you've got one final. I'm just going to say, in a friendly way, Cameron Secretary, we know you're ambitious. We also know you're ambitious for the National Health Service uh, as well. D just in terms of some service reform, do you intend to come to Parliament with a service reform programme to try and get the support of Parliament to build public support around a reform agenda that helps service delivery, particularly as, while well, to focus on the budget, a lot of the challenge we face around workforce issues rather than budgetary issues. And if we are to have a service that meets the workforce that we have, as well as the ambitions we have for delivering health care, that requires some fundamental reform. Do you intend to come to Parliament with a radical reform agenda around our NHS and health and social care services? I think at this point, the sensible thing for me is not to absolutely commit to that until I've, I've continued some of the really important discussions that need to happen, for example, with our rural colleges, as well as our boards, uh, uh, as well as some of our other colleagues. Um, so I'm not saying no to it, but I think it is foolish to commit to doing it until I am sure that we would have a radical reform plan inside uh, this parliamentary term that I would be confident we had support for from some of the key deliverers of it uh, that I would want to bring uh, to Parliament and have that wider discussion. There will be those recommendations in terms of health and social care that Mr Gray's touched on, uh, and I will make sure to be informing Parliament about uh, how ourselves and COSLA intend to go ahead and deliver on those recommendations. So that would be one part of it, but not necessarily the totality of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Whittle. Cabinet Secretary, Mr. Mr. Gray, Mr. McCallum. Um, the, we're moving on to a three-year financial planning framework model, and I wonder what practical changes will that move entail, and also when do you expect boards to be provided with an indicative allocation over that sort of three-year financial term? Well, um, in terms of, of um, practical improvements, I think that what that allows boards to do is in practical terms, look over three over the horizon of three years. And uh, in some of the areas of delivery reform that Mr. Sauer and I have just been uh, touching on, uh, that allows them to uh, uh, plan improvements in delivery and service redesign that may not uh, be as easily done within a 12-month time frame as it may be within a 15-month or 20-month time frame, and to anticipate their resourcing accordingly. I think boards can reasonably anticipate uh, that their core funding uh, is, at the very least, would remain stable. But as you know, uh, as a Scottish government, uh, we do annual budgeting, so I cannot uh, give boards uh, figures for anything beyond 1920. Um, but they, they can reasonably anticipate where they might go in 2021 and, and so on. Um, so the practical uh, improvements that I would expect to see at board level is that that flexibility that they've asked for and that would now match the flexibility that uh, IJBs have because uh, they uh, benefit from the local authority arrangements in terms of reserves and flexibility, that that flexibility now extended to boards would, would allow that better integrated and forward planning. Uh, in terms of practical uh, changes uh, for us as a government, uh, that does allow 
those um, more detailed conversations around service redesign that we touched on and that I expect to see that scaling up of improvements. The waiting times plan is a 30-month plan, uh, so boards can uh, be planning what they need to do over that 30-month period in order to deliver the results uh, that I require of them. Uh, and here, um, our uh, financial monitoring and performance monitoring arrangements uh, will be um, uh, flexed in order to ensure that we are uh, working with boards to ensure that at the end of a three-year period, they do reach balance uh, and that uh, the flexibility that they have in, in year uh, is one that they're using as judiciously as possible. Just to clarify there, I think what you said, there, if we're moving to three-year pl uh, financial planning framework, if you're unable to give the health boards an indicative uh, uh, finances to work to, how does that? how is that then a financial, a three-year financial planning? How can they possibly plan if they don't know how much money they're, they're going to be allocated over a three-year period? Well, Mr Whittle, um, we, I don't know what the Scottish Government's budget will be in 1920, 2020-21. Uh, um, I don't know that because the UK government doesn't work on those longer terms, so we don't know what the Barnet consequentials will be and we don't know where our starting point would be as a Scottish government. So we can't do, as a, a Scottish government, three-year financial planning. So what I cannot give, what I said was I could not give boards uh, figures for 2021 or 2021 22 um, but what we, what we can say to boards is that they should anticipate that their baseline funding in 1920 uh, will not be reduced when we get to 2021. So they have a degree, and I am certain a degree of common sense and uh, financial expertise that would allow them to do that. Presumably the UK government moving on to a multi-year financial planning, you, you'll be able to tie that down a bit, a bit tighter than that? If that is what they did, then that would be for Mr Mackay to decide how he wants the Scottish budget to go forward. If I, uh, if I move on to, to uh, brokerage, I know we, we, uh, there was brokerage of 151.6 million uh, across four boards um, was uh, underwritten, for want of a better expression, uh, by the Scottish Government. Now, does this, you're saying that you're looking for a break-even position over three years. Um, I wonder if you uh, are confident in that uh, particular uh, outcome. And just for clarification, are we looking at um, a break-even for the three years, or are we looking at a break-even for year three, if, if that makes sense? So you're going to break even over three years, over the three-year period, so um, uh, whether it be a loss in the first couple of years and then making that, that short for year three, mm -hmm. or are you looking for a break even by year three? I'm looking for a break even by year three. Okay, because um, we know that, uh, for example, the Ayrshire and Arne have already indicated that they will require brokerage over the next three years. So uh, they're suggesting that they won't meet uh, uh, break even by th by uh, in, in three years. So, what, does the Scottish government underwrite that that brokerage as well? Well, the brokerage that they require over, that they have said they require over the next three years is a continuation of the brokerage they require in this year. Yes. So, uh, what I have said to them is, you are not required to repay that after this year. So from 1920, the brokerage uh, the boards uh, have been given will not be required to be repaid to the Scottish Government. So they start with a clean slate. Oh, I understand that, Cabinet Secretary, but uh, I, um, I also understand from your that uh, even with their clean slate, they will, not, they will still require brokerage going forward for the next three years. That's not my understanding from Ayrshire and Arne. My understanding from them is that their requirement of brokerage over the next three years takes account of the fact that they need it this year. And so they are anticipating over the next three years, uh, at the point where they said that, uh, having to pay that back. Now, that has changed. That situation has changed. Well, I suggest you and I have got different information, Cabinet Secretary. We may have to clarify that. Mm -hmm. We may indeed. OK. OK. On, on that point, uh, Cabinet Secretary, clearly the decision on brokerage is one that, that, that uh, uh, we're familiar with. 
what is your anticipation of the financial position for boards which have not received brokerage? Uh, are you confident that all of those boards are in a place where they will be able to continue to break even on a year-by-year -year basis? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, on, uh, I suppose an, uh, an additional point in relation to that is around uh, monthly reports. You mentioned earlier monthly reports, but I understand uh, in relation to this there have been no monthly reports since September. Is that the, the current position? N no, their the, uh, monthly report was published for November. Uh, the one for December is due to be published. I think what may have happened is that the website, uh, what is it called, URL, um, has changed, although if you go onto the old website, it does direct you towards the new one, and on the new one you will find the November report. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> within the board performance escalation framework, uh, one board not currently in receipt of brokerage, which is identified as potentially in an escalating position, is NHS uh, Fourth Valley. Given that uh, five boards are at various stages, three, four or five in the escalation process, I wonder if you could outline uh, uh, what steps are being taken in these boards to ensure that within the three-year period they are indeed at break-even? Surely. Um, I, I know that we are due to um, send to the committee, and we will do that this week, uh, clarity on what the escalation levels mean and so on. And the, the, the point I will make before I uh, ask Mr Gray to respond in more detail to your question is that a board can be uh, at a particular escalation level for one aspect of its performance. It's not always its financial performance. It may be another area of its performance. Um, but we will set that out uh, for the committee when uh, we formally write to you. But I'll ask Mr Gray to deal with the question you specifically mm -hmm. asked. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the committee, I think, from published data, will be aware that um, uh, NHS Fourth Valley has uh, struggled for some time to improve its emergency department performance and on that basis we've uh, put in a support team to uh, the emergency department. The cabinet secretary covered uh, that at the annual review in December uh, and the uh, chair and the chief executive are fully cited on what needs to be done. Uh, I visited the emergency department over Christmas and New Year to uh, meet them and to meet the uh, support that we're providing so that we ensured that that was uh, working well. So that's the basis on which NHS Fourth Valley are at, at level three. It's um, n not uh, so much connected with their financial position. I welcome what the Cabinet Secretary said about letting us know the position uh, in relation to escalation. Can the escalation position be included in the monthly monitoring reports uh, in future? Is that a, something that can be accommodated? Do you mean at, for in the, in the monthly financial monitoring report what what level they may a board may be at? Yes. Um, I, I think it would be sensible only if it was at a particular level because of its financial performance. Then then you're looking at a financial performance and whether or not it is at a particular level. Would that make sense? It's 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 in relation to financial performance yeah. that that yeah. we'd be keen to to understand yeah. what the position yeah. is. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, Miles Briggs. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I wanted to look at NRAC targets and NRAC funding of health boards, and specifically, um, given the fact that our NHS is receiving um, record additional consequential funding, um, why the Cabinet Secretary and the Finance Secretary haven't used this as an opportunity uh, to finally end the underfunding of some of our health boards? Well, although we, we have received... Uh, consequential funding, uh, additional funding, and uh, the government, uh, this government has made up the shortfall, that still means there are difficult decisions to make. And as I said, we will continue to, I think if I recall correctly, it's £23 million that we're putting into this area to ensure that no board is further away than 0.8% from NRAC funding. Now, uh, when we are in this place next year, we will be continuing to look at what further improvements we can make there. But I think that is a reasonable position for us to take this year. This budget delivers an um, under-percentage increase uh, to boards um, from the overall budget. Um, in my own uh, region of Lothian, that equates to £11.6 uh, million. Pounds less uh, to deliver the same level of services. Um, what impact, and the Cabinet Secretary and I have had a number of conversations 
on uh, services being delivered in Lothian, including delayed discharge, where 40% of all delayed discharge in Scotland is here in NHS Lothian. What impact, under funding the Health Board by £11.6 <coughs> million, pounds, do you think that has here in Lothian in being able to meet the targets which you've set the Health Board? So I need to start out, Mr Briggs, by saying that I don't recognise the numbers that you're talking uh, about at all. Um, the uh, increase to boards in uh, uh, frontline services in this current year was 3.7%. In 1920, it will be 4.2%. Um, in addition, as I set out, there is significant additional funds going into the waiting times improvement plan to mental health. Uh, and, of course, an additional £120 million, uh, being uh, transferred from uh, the health budget to local, to integrated services, in addition to the money that health already puts into those services. So um, the, the work that you, or the issues that you identify quite rightly that need to be addressed in Lothian as elsewhere uh, will be supported by that additional resource. Delayed discharge in particular uh, is uh, an area where uh, the IJB's uh, work is critical. Um, my understanding of uh, the City of Edinburgh IJB's work in this area is that it has shown significant recent improvement in reducing the level of delayed discharge. I'm happy to send you that information uh, if that would be helpful. Um, but also that the, uh, and I think both the local authority and the health board recognise a particular additional pressure uh, in Edinburgh in terms of the Edinburgh economy uh, and the level of uh, uh, wages available and the attractiveness, therefore, uh, of those. And both the uh, health board and the local authority provided additional funds to allow uh, some of that to, to uh, be more competitive in that uh, local labour market, which is precisely the kind of flexibility that integration should permit uh, and we should see realised in order to address particular local pressures. So um, I, <clears throat> I'm not making light or in any sense at all, and I know you understand that, of the particular pressures that are faced in Lothian as elsewhere across the country. The, there is a core that is the same. There are some differences uh, from one area to another, but my starting point is that I don't recognise those figures that you are using. Well, the figures are in the government's briefing <coughs> uh, document, which specifically points towards NHS Lothian being £11.6 million pounds distant uh, from other boards um, in the funding being provided. So obviously being asked to deliver the same, obviously Lothian is also home to a number of national services, so there's additional pressures there as well. But specifically with NRAC targets, um, do you, as a government, still are you still committed to delivering uh, that parity, which you've outlined? But in terms of the services which are also provided here in Lothian, there's additional pressures, which are national services. And NRAC funding also takes into account student numbers. Now, given the growing uh, numbers of students, which is welcome here in Lothian, how do you think NRAC's fit for purpose for Lothian, NHS Lothian in the future? And clearly, uh, given that we're now the highest uh, percentage difference, um, and £11.6 million pounds different. Are you going to look at this again so we can actually see NHS Lothian uh, receive its fair funding? Well, NHS Lothian received, in terms of uh, NRAC, an adjustment of plus £7.7 .7 million. Now, on the overall question of the NRAC formula, I think a number of uh, different parts of the country would argue um, that there are ways, means by which the NRAC formula doesn't particularly work for them in every respect. Um, and I am certainly uh, open to a discussion about the formula as such and whether or not it uh, continues to be as fit for purpose as we need it to be. But the formula, like all formulas, uh, is one where there will always, even if we uh, look to uh, make it as, as good as we can make it, taking account of uh, all the differing demands from the Shetlands to Lothian to Dumfries and Galloway, will nonetheless, as any formula does, produce some uh, who feel it is uh, it works better for them than others. Um, so we, we shouldn't uh, set about this discussion thinking that we're going to find a way of reviewing and revising an, the NRAC formula uh, where everyone is going to be happy at the end of it. But I do accept that there is more work that needs to be done. 
I welcome that and I hope um, as a committee we'll be able to look at this further and, and take that forward. Um, I wanted to shift towards preventative spend within your budget and give you an opportunity to outline um, how that's maybe um, going to be developed in the coming year. Specifically, um, I wanted to ask, is there additional funds going to be made available uh, for the development of the Respiratory Action Plan, um, which the government's outlined it will be published la uh, later this year, um, but there's been no financial commitment to that? So, um, <clears throat> where we've made commitments to uh, publish plans, for example, uh, on Respiratory Action Plan, uh, then if there are financial uh, requirements as part of that plan, then yes, it will be funded. There, there seems to me to be no point in producing an action plan uh, if you don't produce the resources to deliver on that action plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, the review of integration which is being undertaken uh, by the, your strategic group, Ministerial Strategic Group for Health and Community Care, um, I wonder if you can tell us when you expect that to be completed uh, and whether it will be made public. Um, I think Mr Gray is, is probably best um, placed to answer that in terms of the timeline, given that he and uh, Sally Loudon from, Loudon from uh, COSLA are the joint chairs of that review. So the, um, <clears throat> the Ministerial Steering Group meets this month towards the end, and uh, convener, I'll provide you the exact date for uh, sake of not, not getting it wrong. At that uh, meeting, uh, Sally Loudon and I will present to the Ministerial Steering Group the recommendations that uh, have come from the review that we have carried out. Um, as far as I'm aware, the uh, paperwork of the uh, Ministerial Steering Group is in the public domain, so there would be no difficulty whatsoever uh, in sharing not only the recommendations but the views of the MSG with, with this committee um, in early course. So that, what that should mean, convener, is that uh, at some point um, uh, I would anticipate before the February recess, thinking that's around about the middle of February, um, we will be able to provide you with uh, the review group's recommendations and the views of the uh, ministerial group uh, and thereafter uh, how we intend we will follow that through with how we intend to implement those recommendations. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, can you tell us uh, also, in terms of integration authorities, when you would expect their budgets for the coming financial year to be finalised? Um, you start, what, March? Yes. We would expect it to be March. Yeah, fine. Thank you very much. And um, we've, you, you will know that one of the things we focused on in our pre-budget report was uh, the requirement for integration authorities to report budgets against outcomes and I know you shared uh, uh, some of the concerns that were expressed by the committee. Uh, do you expect any uh, development on that front in the coming financial year? So we, we are, um, Mr McCallum may want to say a bit more, um, our, our senior finance officials are working with the IJB finance officers uh, to look at how uh, that may be um, implemented in a bit more detail. I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, so um, one thing that we can say at the moment is that IJBs do publish annual performance reports, uh, and included within that is a, a financial report. Um, and increasingly what we're looking to see, um, and, and these need to be published within three months at the end of the financial year. So I think what we'd be very keen to see on the basis of the current 18-19 financial year is what progress against some of the outcomes that we've talked about, whether that's in mental health or primary care or ADPs, where we're starting to see some things being delivered. So I think those annual performance reports are going to be really key and really crucial as we move forward uh, over the coming years. We've also developed, uh, uh, or we also have a finance development group who is looking specifically at some of the more complex finance issues that there are in integration, and we'll be using that group as well to, 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 to get into how we can uh, budget more effectively to see some of those outcomes being delivered. So I think there is scope to, 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 to see more of that. That's very helpful. We're still, I think, awaiting quarter two of 2018-19 in terms of financial information. For I, th I think it may be a similar problem to the, the health board okay. information. That has been published, it and, has been published and, yeah. and, and, okay. and the information is there and available. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm interested in uh, set-aside budgets because previously in committee I've asked for questions and sought clarification on the purpose of set-aside budgets and uh, 
they're sometimes referred to as unscheduled care budgets or budgets that are retained by NHS boards for larger hospital sites which provide integrated and non-integrated services. And we took evidence in committee, both oral and written, that said that uh, um, set-asides aren't quite working appropriately as intended and might even be hindering some integration. So I'm interested to know if any action could be taken or is intended being taken to look at set-aside budgets and do you agree that they might be hindering integration or and uh, is there a way that set-asides management changes are required? Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm familiar with um, uh, that concern. Uh, it has been raised with me uh, uh, by Councillor Curry in COSLA and uh, there are a number of areas uh, in terms of how uh, the financial position of IJBs uh, operates that uh, we need to consider, he and I. We've begun some consideration of that, and that includes uh, what are referred to as set-aside budgets, uh, which uh, are uh, under the remit of the IJB, uh, but I appreciate that in some circumstances some IJBs uh, do not feel uh, that they have the degree of uh, commissioning authority over that over those funds uh, as uh, they believe they should have. Um, the picture is uh, disparate across the country uh, as with uh, other matters in terms of integration. Um, I think what is clear, what is a helpful starting point is the Audit Scotland report that talks about where uh, leadership is good, to return to Mr Sarwar's point, where uh, leadership works well, then we don't see some of these uh, issues around uh, uh, which budget is where, uh, but we, we see a strong focus on uh, the quality of the service and the appropriateness of the service and how it is delivered in a way that achieves the best outcomes for individuals. So what I am keen to do is uh, work with um, our chief officers and with COSLA, and we've begun that work, uh, to try and uh, help all of them reach the same position uh, where some of the, the better ones are, both in terms of their outcomes, but also the approach that's used. Now, part of that will be looking at whether there are mechanisms uh, and levers that we might usefully um, uh, tweak or move, uh, both in terms of set-aside, in terms of uh, what is expected uh, from the funds that, that go from health, uh, via local government or directly into uh, IJBs in terms of the outcomes that should be delivered uh, and also uh, where some of our IJBs uh, have significant levels uh, of unearmarked reserves uh, and have been carrying those for some time, uh, what might be the most uh, appropriate use of some of that additional resource. So we, we have that discussion begun uh, uh, initially, myself and Councillor uh, Curry, we will continue that and we will look to uh, reach some resolution in advance of the 1920 financial year. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, David Torrance. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. Um, Cabinet Secretary, on the subject of reg regional planning, the Committee has previously heard concerns over operations of regional planning boards and the way in which it interacts with NHS boards. When will the regional delivery plans be made available? And whether, do you consider whether lines of accountability are to be considered working effectively in the context of integration of health and social care regionalisation? So the uh, regional plans are currently being, the draft regional plans are currently being discussed with um, local stakeholders uh, when that exercise is completed uh, and they uh, return to me with uh, any uh, adjustments or comments uh, required, then I'll review those and would uh, expect to be able to publish them uh, in this financial year so people are clear about where we're going in the next financial year. Uh, in terms of um, concerns or uh, uh, discussed confusions around accountability, I think accountability is clear. Health boards are accountable for what they deliver. Uh, IJBs are accountable for what they deliver. Uh, health, the, the idea of regional working uh, is not new in our health service at all. Um, and what the uh, regional plans uh, were, are looking to do is to see where we can build on the experience uh, of regional working in previous uh, services 
to improve the quality of outcomes for patients, uh, either in those services or in other areas. So um, if uh, uh, boards uh, or uh, chief officers require further clarity on uh, accountability, I'm very happy to give that, but I think it is pretty clear. Cabinet Secretary, what will be the benefit to NHS of a 700 million of investment in social care and integration? Well, this is, I think, across, um, across the piece in this parliament, uh, widely agreed upon and recognised as the right direction of travel, that um, our uh, acute hospital setting is absolutely appropriate when there is a clinical need for that, but uh, what the majority of people in Scotland, uh, I would include myself in that, is uh, want is uh, care and support, uh, both healthcare and social uh, care and support uh, in my own home or in as homely a setting uh, as uh, possible. So shifting the balance of care, integrating health and social care is exactly the right direction of travel. The additional resources we're putting into that uh, is designed uh, to further support it and, and drive the pace on it. I think it is significantly um, enhanced by the work that is underway in primary care, um, with a core component of that, of course, being the new GP contract uh, and the proposition uh, of GP clusters, of our general practitioners being recognised and given the status that they should have as the uh, expert local clinical lead, the expert uh, clinical generalist working with a team of multidisciplinary professionals providing appropriate care um, for individuals dependent on uh, what their uh, particular health need might be. That is a core element uh, of the reform in primary care um, and that itself is a significant driver in terms of integration. And, but at the end of the day, we've touched on it a little bit earlier, um, one of the fundamental uh, principles behind integration is for the individual who, re who requires and is entitled to and should expect quality health or social care, they really shouldn't be troubled about whose budget it is. They should simply receive the care that we have set out uh, as care that we want to be able to deliver. And questions about uh, accountability and governance and budgets are important, but they're important as the underpinning to that delivery. Uh, and so, of course, we should pay attention to them. But the bottom line is people should get the care and the support that they need and that we've committed to delivering. Very much. Uh, Emma Harper. Just a wee sup, convener. Thank you. To pick up on David Torrance's question about social care, um, how much has been invested in the draft budget for uh, free personal care for under 65? So that it would be an interesting figure just to get out there. So it's £30 million pounds, okay. uh, is what has been committed in the draft budget and clearly um, uh, vitally important to deliver um, uh, uh, that for under 65s. Um, we've reached that amount uh, in consultation uh, with COSLA um, and based on uh, our estimated figures and it includes uh, an estimated figure uh, in our work with them about the implementation of that extension of support. Okay, thank you. Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to um, talk about delayed discharge, um, a more national picture, because I know um, when the Cabinet Secretary was appointed, it was something she um, specifically set as one of uh, her visions and goals uh, to try to address. And um, figures out today have shown a 4% increase um, in November compared to November of 2017. So I wondered, in terms of addressing that, and where we are currently with the integration of health and social care, um, are you confident you will have achieved that in the next two years? Yes, I am. Um, Given that 4% increase we've seen... Uh -huh, in but I've only been alone. here for six months. Um, Not blaming so, it just on you. It's so your I'm 11 just years starting. of government, I suppose. In, in the grand scheme of things, Mr Briggs, I'm just starting. Um, and you, it, you, it, it, you know, I... I uh, absolutely share your concern about delayed discharge and I share it because for the individual who is delayed this has potentially a significant impact absolutely. on them um, whether they are frail elderly or not there is an impact uh, on on uh, on them as a, a person 
and that is, I know, our shared absolute focus. So I'm very concerned about delayed discharge, and I'm concerned about it because I can see in other part, in some parts of our country, where uh, there is uh, little, if no, delayed discharge. So that takes me back to the, the points we've touched on uh, earlier in terms of could we stop talking about sharing good practice and start applying it? Uh, which takes me back in terms of our IJBs to the very productive conversations I've had with Councillor Curry and with uh, his colleagues in COSLA about how we use what already is uh, Scottish Government and local authority good practice in the Children and Young People's Collaborative that has produced significant improvements in that area. Can we use uh, that approach that learning, those skills that already exist in both uh, our health service and in local authorities to um, apply good practice and not simply talk about good practice. So uh, there, whilst there are, uh, and I completely accept, um, different local pressures uh, for different IJBs in different parts of the country, we touched on it with specific reference to Edinburgh earlier. What I do not accept is that there is significant difference in individual or patient need that would account for those kind of differences. Nor do I accept that there is significant difference in funding uh, demands or requirements or allocations that would account for those differences. So I have little patience with uh, that degree of disparity in delayed discharge figures across Scotland. And what I need to do, because integration is a joint venture with local authorities, is I need to work with Councillor Curry, and we are doing so very productively, uh, and with the chief officers. There was a, a large meeting of chief officers um, uh, towards the latter end of last year, uh, where I made this position very clear. Um, they all applauded, so I presume they're all agreeing with me, um, that what we need to do now Don't is actually, um, two years in, begin to apply good practice. There is a minimum that should be required, and that's the direction of travel I'm going in. Um, it's those who maybe don't agree with you, you maybe need to listen to more. And I think that's um, where we try to move forward health and social care integration. I think it's really important. And, you know, there is a political consensus that this is the right di direction of travel. But two and a half years into this, to see a 4% increase is clearly not going where we all want it to go. So I hope in the time this government has left over the next two years that we can see where there's opportunities to reform health and social care, that you will listen to voices across this parliament and ideas which uh, parties have been bringing forward to try to really tackle this, because I totally agree with what you said at the beginning. These are people's lives, these are often people's parents and grandparents in hospital when they shouldn't be there, and that has to change. Mm -hmm. and, and you have my absolute assurance that I will listen to ideas regardless of where they, they come from. I think in the last two years I've demonstrated that. Um, I'm not averse. Uh, to good ideas uh, where they can be evidenced and where we can show uh, real improvement as a consequence of them, then I'm very happy uh, to take those on board. Um, I think that uh, you are right in particular, uh, it's always worthwhile listening to those who disagree with you um, to understand the nature of those disagreements. Sometimes disagreements um, are hyped up as proxies for something else. Uh, sometimes it's about fear of change. Uh, sometimes uh, it's about protection of personal status, uh, and I understand all of that too. Uh, but I think that the, the fact that we have such widespread political consensus for this as the right direction of travel um, gives us very good grounds to stand on. The work that uh, COSLA is doing uh, with social care providers is another important area in uh, looking at a new national contract, and some of the work that we've begun in terms of our discussions with social care and others uh, around the provision of residential care uh, is also equally important. And we need to be looking at all of that in the round. Thank you very much. Sandra White, brief. Just a moment to, to, to pick up on what was said before. <clears throat> I hate to, you know, the health service being used as a political tool. It's, it's absolutely wrong. And we do agree on the integration of health and social care. I just wanted to ask the Cabinet Secretary, Dave Torrance mentioned the £700 million pounds that was being put into that, which is good news, and I hope everybody agrees with that. And for me, anyway, and I think most people here, uh, when I deal with cases, 
the, what's happening is delayed discharges because there's not enough care homes to be picked up for people, elderly people being discharged. And I think that's where the integration of health and social care is so important. Now, it's probably a statement, I'm sorry to do this, but I get pretty angry when they constantly get attacked and we're moving in that direction. And you all said we all agree in that. So I just want to ask the Cabinet Secretary, I know it's a long-term issue, but would you see improvements in the situation with delayed discharge, particularly with the £700 million being put in to integration in health and social care? Because I think that is the absolute nub of, of, of the, the situation. So... I, I absolutely expect to see improvement with that level of investment. And uh, if we go back to, I think, uh, one of your earlier questions, uh, Ms White, was about um, the balance of allocation to health boards and then uh, what was described as in-year allocations and, and why I think that's the right balance to have, because I think it is very important to focus on, it, in effect, in simple terms, what the money buys. Uh, and what impact additional resources will have. So that's uh, how this budget is framed, if you like. Um, I think it is interesting, the whole question of social care, care homes uh, and care at home. Um, there, there is some interesting uh, evidenced work from social care that points to uh, a changing use of residential care, uh, particularly for elderly, um, with more uh, rest, less long-term more respite, uh, more uh, short-term short step-down work uh, from uh, hospitals and so on, uh, and other, other means by which uh, the care home sector uh, is already changing, uh, but we require to work with them on those changes. Uh, and there is uh, elsewhere in my portfolio area a major piece of work uh, underway on the reform of adult social care, uh, which is looking in particular less in the area that we are currently talking in, but more in uh, adult social care more widely, where we're looking at individuals uh, with complex health and social care needs, requiring uh, lifetime packages uh, of uh, high intensity uh, and the resourcing to that, and how we might work with local authorities in order uh, to uh, support and improve the availability of those packages by having a different way of approaching the resourcing of those packages. So there's, there is a lot of work going on in this area, and I think the whole area of adult social care is one that is very deserving of a lot of our attention. Thank you, you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Almost finally, I think I have a question around Food Standard Scotland, whom we heard from in December. Um, and uh, in particular, we heard from them about the costs they faced in dealing with the consequences of preparations for Brexit, uh, which I think they estimated for the current financial year to be in the region of uh, £1.3 million. Now, the budget includes uplifts both from the Scottish Government and UK financed uh, expenditure as well for Food Standards Scotland. Do you, in your view, uh, does that do these increases provide sufficient uh, support for further preparations for Brexit, which they may be required to make uh, in, the f in the next financial year? Well, I think the, the detail uh, behind those increases is uh, in the uh, level four information. I'm going to ask Mr McCallum to uh, just talk through what those increases are for, and I'll come back to uh, potential costs of Brexit. Yeah, so there's a, a 0.7 million uh, funding uplift for um, uh, Food Standards Scotland in 2019-20, and there's two elements to that budget uplift. One is is a, is, is a kind of technical accounting adjustment. Uh, they get funding for um, impairments and provisions, and so that re that's reflected, and that's about half of that increase. The other half is, is particularly in relation to... Um, uh, animal feed and some specific work that uh, Food Standards Scotland are taking forward in relation to, to animal feed. So so that there is a budget uplift for, for FSS, but I think there's a wider uh, uh, discussion that Food Standards Scotland are having with the Scottish Government about Brexit and the preparations for, for Brexit. Mm -hmm. So just finally on that, um, uh, as members will know, I think from a statement that Mr Russell made uh, most recently in the Parliament, um, the Scottish Government's uh, resilience uh, group is working uh, now on a weekly basis. That involves uh, key ministers, uh, myself, uh, obviously Mr Ewing and others. It's chaired by the DFM. 
uh, and a, a large number of officials uh, looking at uh, what preparations uh, are required to be undertaken in the event of uh, no deal Brexit, but also in the event of Brexit, in terms of, in my area, for example, in terms of uh, medicine and medical devices supply and other matters. Uh, and in all of that, as we work through uh, the detail of what that is and what we anticipate may be costs, either additional costs or costs um, that will be incurred uh, in this or the coming financial year that are brought forward costs, then uh, we are working with Mr Mackay to try and ensure that we uh, are able to um, take as many precautions and anticipatory planning decisions on all of that as we can. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Now, clearly, we, there are important areas of policy which time has simply not permitted us to address in detail this morning. I think of sport, of, of alcohol and drugs, of mental health, among others. Uh, if the Cabinet Secretary is agreeable, we may drop you a line uh, with those questions, and it would be very helpful if it was uh, possible for you to respond to those uh, before we come to the debate in Parliament in two weeks' time. Yes, of course. Of Thank course you very much. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you very much. We'll now conclude the public session uh, of this meeting and we will suspend briefly and then continue in private session. Thank you very much.